speaking to you from unceded Coast Salish territory in what is sometimes called British Columbia, Canada. Um, these are the these are the traditional territories of the Seashelt and Squamish nations. I am delighted to be with you at the Othering and Belonging Summit. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that warm introduction. And I'm grateful to the work of all the organizers and especially the thought leadership of the great John Powell for this deeply generative framing. The climate crisis is an ecological crisis. It is an industrial crisis. It is a consumption crisis. It is a crisis of imperialism and colonialism. And underneath it all, it is a crisis produced by the logic of othering and the absence of a society rooted in commitments to true belonging. So what does it mean to say that the climate crisis comes from othering? It means that the age of fossil fuel capitalism that created and perpetuates the climate crisis is inseparable from the project of white supremacy. The excess capital that unleashed the industrial age and the carbon now overheating our planet came directly from the intertwined genocides of the transatlantic slave trade and the violent theft of indigenous lands. Without these foundational crimes, there would not have been the hungry market for coal-fired steam engines in Manchester's mills. Once the age of fossil fuels began, more othering was required. Because here's the thing, there is no safe, clean way to power an economy on coal or oil. You have to have sacrifice zones. You have to have people and places deemed worthy of sacrifice, poisoning, cast outside the circle of belonging. For a time, economists told us that the rampant air and water pollution was just an unfortunate phase on the road to a cleaner, more civilized economy. But in fact, they never went away. The poisoning and pollution was just moved around geographically while increasing exponentially as the global economy expanded. It was moved to frontline racialized communities in the global north. In fact, it was always there. And in the sites of intensive offshore production in the global south. If wars and occupations were required to keep the oil flowing, then wars and occupations were waged. In short, Fossil capital requires sacrifice zones, requires a range of others. And now with climate change, the sacrifice zone has widened to a planetary scale. The impacts remain highly unequal and distributed according to these fault lines of race and class that determine who is first to be sacrificed. But no one is truly safe, which is why billionaires are so very interested in outer space. That is what a world built on othering has produced, a world on fire. And here I'm talking about the fires of climate disruption, but not only those fires. I'm also talking about the political fires, the fires of hatred, where we have strong men figures around the world who are tapping into deep insecurities, deep fears and vulnerabilities, um, and saying, don't look up at the system, don't look up at the people who produce these crises, look at the other. Um, and there's a reason for that. We are in a moment of system failure and they don't want the attention focused on the system. They would rather have it focused on the immigrant, on the criminal, on the invader, on the replacer. So these are some of the fires that we are up against. But we do not live in a time of just two fires, those climate fires and those fires of hatred. There is a third fire and it is also blazing. And that fire is our surging social movements, our movements demanding racial justice, economic justice, climate justice, gender justice, reparative justice, justice for indigenous people and land back. And young people are at the heart of this third fire, bringing so much energy and moral clarity to these movements. And more than that, insisting on connecting all of the dots between all of these overlapping and intersecting crises. So now let me bring in some of the amazing young people who we're gonna hear from today about the work that they are already doing across the globe to build a world with more belonging. They are imagining and building a different future 
as we just saw in that amazing film. Uh, first, I wanna introduce Samia, who's joining us from London, and it's very late there. Thank you, Samia, for, for staying up and being part of this conversation. Samia is a British-born Sierra Leonean who founded Seize the Vote to help make political discussions more interactive and accessible and to empower young people from marginalized backgrounds to be aware of how to influence change in their communities. Next, we have Kate Yao calling from Singapore where it's already morning and happy Earth Day. It's already Earth Day in Singapore. Kate founded the Bring Your Own Bottle Singapore campaign in 2018. Um, what she, she described herself, and this is not my words, a very clueless student environmentalist and decided to take a leap of faith and email businesses to encourage BYO practices. Only three said yes at the time but her org has now collaborated with over 25 brands and organizations and reached out to close to 10,000 people. Welcome, Kate. Um, next, I will introduce the young woman who we already met from that uh, beautiful video, Shia Batista. Uh, Shia co-founded Re the Re-Earth Initiative along with Kate and others. Shia is a Mexican Chilean climate activist and a member of the indigenous Mexican uh, Otomi Toltec Nation. Um, I'm just going to check the chat here. Um, and we we may be joined by Takata Iron Eyes a little bit later on. Um, if Takata is able to join us, um, then I will introduce her at the time. Um, but for now, what we're going to do is begin this conversation uh, with this amazing group of young leaders. So I want to ask each of you, Young people, and especially young people of color from around the world, have in many ways led the demand for a more expansive climate movement. Um, you didn't just want to be invited to the table. You wanted to transform the table, sometimes probably upend the table. What needed to change in the climate movement and why? And where do you think we're headed now? I'm going to start with Yushia. Uh, well, thank you for that question. And first of all, let me say thank you all for holding this space. Uh, I think it's really amazing that we're all getting to talk to each other. Um, and, you know, many things needed to change at that table, as I'm sure you know, Naomi. First, uh, we were not, um, you know, including that indigenous philosophy of reciprocity with Mother Earth. And I think that's the thing that we were missing the most because like you said all of our systems are rooted in a system of capitalism and imperialism even in the climate movement even the 60 years ago when earth day was first started um most of the people founding these organizations were white men who had uh, not a comprehensive view of what climate justice means, what we're fighting for right now. And, you know, when the youth movement started about at this level, you know, about three years ago, two years and a half ago, we were still using that language of you're stealing our future, which is pretty damaging language when you think about the fact that we need everyone. We need intergenerational cooperation. And that's why I think that indigenous thought is so important because I learned to talk to my elders. I learned to have youth and elder circles. I learned to learn from wisdom and to give energy. Um, and that's what we need. We need those type of holistic solutions. We need to realize that um, we're not gonna fix the climate crisis in the same systems that we're in right now. We need to change those systems. We need to um, you know, bring a new energy, a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift of changing the way that we live right now. And it's gonna be really hard, but I think my generation is ready to do that. So I think those are some of the things that we're missing from the climate movement that we're hoping to change and shift. Thank you, Shia. And I wanna, I wanna get a little deeper later on into this, the question of how we really do build intergenerationally, because I know that there are a lot of older people who are participating in this conference who wanna help and are, don't wanna step on toes and want some advice, so we'll come back to that. Uh, Samia, talk to me about the table. Um, I think it's, it's, it's pretty tough in the UK. Um, at, at, what have you been up against? Is it changing? Uh, I think those colonial roots of the green movement are really quite evident in the UK. Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. Like that is something that I tackle a lot with over here in the UK. So just as an introduction, um, 
I'm a climate justice activist, but I enter the movement as an air pollution activist. Um, I was born and raised in East London and it has historical issues with air pollution. And in East London, that's where most ethnic minorities reside. And I basically connected those dots essentially and bringing race and class into the conversation kind of seemed foreign. Um, I was 18, 19 at the time, by the way, I'm 25, just turned 25 last week. And yeah, like at that time, I just remember people looking at me like, how, why are you like bringing race into this? Why are you bringing class into this? And I've seen a strong movement of people being more open and welcoming to understanding the intersectional lens that is needed for the work that we have to do here in the UK. And luckily I was strengthened by a good support network. So I joined Young Friends of the Earth Europe and we created an intersectional manifesto saying, hey, as young people, this is what we want to see in the climate movement, especially across Europe. And a lot of people kind of adopted that across um, European regions. And more talk has been coming in the climate justice movement in the UK. So for example, Wretched of the Earth, they go really strong in making sure that every voice is included in talking about environmental justice. And we like to make the connection, the connections with colonialism, especially British colonialism, which all of you know a fair amount of, and I'm not gonna dig deep into that. And yeah, I think we are moving in the right direction, but we do struggle against big NGOs who still still feel uncomfortable um, grasping the social justice language and lots of young people are taking charge of that. And I think we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I would love to ask you, Kate, where, how do you come to the table? Are you, are you turning it over? Uh, are you changing the play settings? Um, what's your relationship with the, with the uh, quote unquote traditional environmental movement? I think previously there was a lot of focus on technology, you know, like renewable energy, um, solar, hydrogen and all that. And I think those are important. But previously, few people were talking about the values that guide the climate movement. And that is something that young people are increasingly aware of. And so I would say that in more stable times, people's dominant virtues tend to revolve around like competition, individualism, self-preservation. And these are so deeply ingrained in our culture that people think it's the only way forward. Um, but I think one thing that COVID-19 showed was that with sufficient mobilization, people are capable of sharing and redistribution and collaboration. And these are the same values that we will need to tackle, not just the climate crisis, but social and economic inequality. Um, and so these are like some of the values that young people are trying to bring in. And for me, the question on my mind is really, how do we bring about that shift from being reactive to proactive, such that these values like collective action and solidarity all continue? Because we need to remember that there are communities who live in crisis every day, not just during the pandemic. Thank you for that. Yeah, that is so beautifully put um, that it, underneath it all, this really is about a revolution in values. There isn't going to be an easy techno fix. Um, we have to change how we treat each other. And, and that's why I think this framing around othering and belonging is um, really transformational. And we, um, we have been joined by Takata Iron Eyes, um, which is very good news. Uh, Takata is a, is a Lakota climate activist and member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. She has been confronting injustice since she was nine years old, testifying against a Uranian mine in the sacred Black Hills. She continues to defend indigenous lives, land and sovereignty on many fronts from the movement against the Dakota Access Pipeline at Standing Rock, which is when we first met, uh, to the movement demanding justice for murdered and missing indigenous women. She is a powerhouse. Uh, Takata, it is so good to see you again. Yes, um, <laughs> it is so good to see you as always, Naomi. <laughs> and we're, we're talking about, you know, the usual, uh, how we need to change the climate movement so that it is actually a movement that that is, that is gonna fight for the world that we really right. need. The mission, the mission, <laughs> shared mission. Um, yeah, 
I think definitely with the time that we've had, you know, to reflect and hopefully grow um, and also rest in this pandemic time, I know that that's a big ask considering, um, but it's also a necessary one, I think, considering the heavy amount of grief, I believe a lot of us to be carrying, you know, um, sort of adjacent to right actual victims of violence within our communities at this time I, I i don't say that lightly right when we consider how intentional it was um and 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 also how gravely dangerous it has been with the past administration um and this pandemic it's been very harrowing times um with with lots of death and lots of grieving um that we're still processing actually my i i i would bring this um i wouldn't normally ever bring this in but i think that it's something that's really sitting heavy with me right now and and i wanted to share that my relatives ladonna uh ladonna allard she passed away um on the 10th and she was also a powerhouse it was her land actually that we were able to incept the standing rock movement on the ocheti shakoni physical encampment the sacred stone encampment was started on her land and she passed away and we buried her right like not even a stone's throw away from the pipeline that she died fighting um and so i think that that work right which is so constant um and is never delayed uh even in such difficult times right like to to very much be viscerally faced with the fact that we have um been forced to participate in systems that traffic in our death right like somebody benefits off of the death of people who work in resistance, people who work on the path of liberation, right? Like there is very much um, something gained and something lost there. And I think that this time has given everybody a chance to start asking kind of like, why are things the way that they are? Um, and who, who, is determining that and who needs things to stay this way. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's kind of where I, I've been sitting um, and am sitting now. <laughs> and it's thank you. It's, yeah, it's like minds. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Ladonna has been on my mind so much. She's was one of the brightest lights I've ever encountered. I remember so much meeting her in the same time that I met you. Um, and, and she immediately said to me, you know, this is why we kept our traditions alive, our ceremonies alive. So we would be ready for a moment like this when people were finally ready to listen. And that brings up, I think something I'd like to go around again, but maybe start with you Takata and, and, and everybody. And, and it's already, um, Shia already spoke to this a bit. A lot of the way that youth climate movement has been framed is kind of intergenerational warfare. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not about like letting my generation off the hook. Um, but, I also think that there's a way in which that discourse also keeps us from talking about systems, um, uh, also keeps us from talking about the very powerful economic forces that want to keep those systems intact. Um, and and Takata, you grew up in a, in a in a family of fighters in a tradition of resistance. Um, so what how can we speak about this differently and how can we truly build an intergenerational movement um that does take leadership from young people uh but also respects the teaching not of any old elder but the elders who've earned it <laughs> right um yeah i i think that there is definitely a sort of dissonance right in in everyone's sort of lack of education because throughout history right the only documented perspective has been from the dominant culture, the colonizer, the oppressor, right? Um, 
And for me, like, obviously, there's so much blame to place and there's so much anger and rage to be had at the events that have occurred, at the genocides that have occurred, right? Um, and we take a look at that and, and if we could turn our heads a little um, and rather than looking at that and staying and sitting in that for, for so long to the point where it's crippling, you know, to the point where it's de detrimental to our own well-being, um, taking a look at the actual human beings and recognizing the humanity and the dignity of those who survived, right? like the amount of strength and courage and perseverance that it took for our relatives and, and our ancestors to live um, and, and to breathe, like what a task that was at those times. Um, and the entire worlds, I guess, and different realms that we can imagine and, and we can create for their dreams and you know their inspirations to exist, to allow them those sort of intricacies and, and to allow ourselves those intricacies now, right? That we don't have to always sit in hurt, but that it is a constant part of us. Um, and and as a teacher, let it let it be a teacher to us rather than um, a wound, mm. I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely to recognize, right, that we aren't the first to have these ideas, right? Like, and it's not actually anything new. Like our ancestors knew how to live in companionship and in relationship with the earth and all things that, that walk in this realm. Um, and it's actually the newest thing is to, the newest thing, which is, you know, the American dream, which is the nations that we 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 live in, right? The systems that we live in, those things are new, mm -hmm. um, and they have killed the planet at a really alarming rate within their young lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I I think that's such a good point about just humility around like these are not new ideas. Um, and everything doesn't have to be new to be good, right? Yeah. I mean, that's part of capitalism that it's constantly looking for, like, what's the new hashtag that's going to make th this thing that's been around for a long time seem fresh and new and consumable, right? Right. Um, Shia, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, um, you know, what you just said, Takara, like, just took my brain to so many different things. But one of the first things that I'll came to mind was you talked about education and how everything that we are taught comes from the people who won or whatever that means, the people who committed those genocides, the people who uh, have destroyed the a lot of the culture and traditions that we have held for thousands of years. And when I you know, finally got to university uh, last semester and was finally able to choose my own classes and choose classes that had to do with environmental justice, um, the first text that I am always given to read in like the four different environmental classes that I've taken is the tragedy of the commons. Oh, and, no. <laughs> and I'm sure like, you know, Naomi's reaction just tells you like how bad it is. But for those who don't know, it basically says, um, if you give land to people, they will self-destroy. And I think that teaching us that all of our environmental understanding around economics, around physics, around you know, just humanity, humanitarian discourse is not trusting us to keep the land alive is harmful. And the fact that that is what I'm learning in my environmental classes, in my economics and environment, physics and environment classes, is, is just hurtful for the movement, for, you know, our ancestors who actually know how to live in harmony with the earth, who don't need to profit off of, um, you know, land, and we don't need structures to separate the land and separate us from the land. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the main things that came to mind, how we need to actually shift the foundation of what we think the environmental movement is and what we think tackling the climate crisis is, because it's still written um, by capitalistic thought, even in the solar industry, you know, they're trying to find loopholes as to how to sell more and how to make the most profit. And I see that a lot of the climate solutions that we have are embedded with loopholes so that the people crafting them can get a, a, can get away with um, more destruction. And something that you mentioned, Naomi, at the beginning is 
all this system needs sacrifice zones and those yeah. sacrifice zones are not chosen uh without intention you know and the sacrifice zones that have been chosen are indigenous communities communities that are seen as having the least political power to change and that's why we're here because we need to make waves okay. uh, we need to, you know no, it's not about moving forward and it's not about coming up with a new new technology like kate said it's about going back going back to our roots, going back to our connection, going back to our own understanding as humans of what living in the earth is. And it's not about moving away from earth. It's about, you know, connecting our spirit with the spirit of mother earth. Thank you, Shia. Um, Samia, I, I wanted to pick up on the, this, um, you, 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 you referenced the, the group uh, wretched of the earth. I don't know if many people in, in the US know that there's a, a, a climate justice coalition in the UK called wretched of the earth, of course, um, in, it, drawing its name from Frantz Fanon. And it's, it's, um, it's itself a challenge to the traditional green movement. And there has been conflict um, with those traditional conservationist, uh, uh, um, that conservationist side of the, of the, of the uh, environmental movement and there's this discourse, and I'm just going to surface this because I think it's really important when we think about what we want to change, where it's, and I've heard this specifically around Wretched of the Earth of like, what kind of name is that? You know, don't we all want to be like sunny and, 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 and just have like a big old, you know, earth that we play volleyball with at our rallies? And, and shouldn't the message just be, we're all in this together um, and a kind of a flattening, right? Um, and there is another way of seeing it, which is that the people who have been designated as wretched, who have been sacrificed, have much more to fight for, right? And I think that you know, weaving together, you know, Takata's um, experience in 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 building the the the, the no dapple movement and and the Standing Rock resistance. That's what it looks like when a community is fighting for its water, right? Um, it, it's a different kind of movement. So, so let's talk specifically about about this this idea of let's bring in everybody, but let's not have conflict versus what you're trying to do with Wretched of the Earth. Yeah. So, like, just for reference, I'm not a spokesperson for Wretched of the Earth. Just a huge fan of their work and our politics align very well. Um, yeah, like I kind of dislike and come into confrontation when I meet environmentalists who are like, oh no, everything is fine. Like, let's not talk about the colonial past of the UK and Europe. Let's just try and move on and move into a post-racial future. That's what they love to say. And it's just like, no, we have to address the issues that are underlying the social inequities that we're seeing today. Like, why are black and brown people residing in areas of low environmental quality? Why are black and brown people like going through social inequities that are linked to food insecurity, energy insecurity? Like, why is that? And when you dig deep to those roots, you see there's strong colonial links with that. And whenever I come across traditional conservationists, it's kind of like they want to like brush young people's voices away. It's like, oh, you guys don't have the right academic qualifications or the right reading to enter this conversation and bring those topics up. Um, just for background, I studied geography and environmental science and lots of the curriculum involved learning about old white male conservationists, explorers, who went to Africa, Asia, Latin America, and they collected artifacts and data, basically rewriting our culture's narrative. And this is something that we in the decolonial movement is trying to address. We're trying to decolonize the curriculum because it wasn't a white man who discovered an island. There were people there. People were living there. They were enjoying their lives. They were foraging. They, they knew their land, they knew their culture, and they knew everything about it. It's not just what the white British colonizer thinks of that land. So we try and like, I guess we're wretched in a way because we want to dismantle everything. We want to break everything and say, no, this is what you've built. This is not we built as a collective. You came here 
and created a whole narrative, a whole history that is not accurate, is not representative, and it overlooks our existence and it actually dehumanizes us in a way because it looks at our communities as if we don't have the intelligence, we don't have the intellect to actually speak up for ourselves. And this is where white saviorism comes in, where people are look people like me, for example, will look down on it as like, oh, like you don't have the intellect to, you know, formulate your own ideas, your own theories, your own concepts. And this is something that different movements are trying to do in the UK, especially like NUS, uh, the um, student body, which is trying to decolonize the curriculum. And you have other bodies in the UK that are working hard, especially in natural scientists, sciences uh, departments, where they're trying to make sure that scientists and academics are actually providing an accurate representation of history and actually connecting with global scholars so that we don't just have stories and narratives that come from the white man. And yeah, it's a tough battle, but we're not afraid, we're not ashamed. Um, this is something that we want to do. We don't care about making people feel uncomfortable. The state makes us feel uncomfortable. The state has made us, you know, like second class citizens. It has become, it has been violent to us. So we feel that we have to be violent back in different angles. And yeah, if we feel that we have to make everything comfortable, then where is the change coming? Where is the growth coming? Growth is uncomfortable. We need to go through growing pains. If you're privileged and you feel uncomfortable it's about something, you need to check why you feel discomfort in this discourse. Thank you for that. Um, Kate, uh, I, I, I was so interested that you were talking about going straight to the shift in values. Um, and I think one of the other um, tensions that is always present um, that's, I think, helpful to surface is this, this tension around the individual action um, versus the systemic action or the big policy that's going to uh, respond at scale. And your own activism has been focused on cons changing consumer behavior and moving away from a culture of disposability but you're clearly interested in these bigger shifts that that represents. So talk to me about the relationship between those individual actions and the broader, the broader shift in values. Yeah, I think very often people tend to pit individual and systemic action against each other. But for me, they're not mutually exclusive. I think there are so many parts in synergy and if we're going to dismantle all these power structures that are harming people, we need both. Um, and so last year, me and Xie, we organized this massive Earth Day campaign and we asked people, what is one individual change you can make and what's one systemic change you can make? And I think one thing that stood out to me in all the responses for systemic change was people were talking about things like um, community organizing, um, protesting on the street, and that stands out to me because people in the US and Europe, maybe they can do that. But in societies like Singapore, the risk is so much higher because of the limited freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So where I'm from, public protests are, are generally not allowed. There is one park in the entire country where you can hold a public protest. So literally just that one park. Um, and even then you have to apply for a permit from the police. A lot of people apply, but um, a huge majority get rejected anyway. And so I think while youth in like the Western side of the world, they have more direct avenues to get the voices heard. It's not the same across the world. And these are all things that we need to start shifting if we really want to drive systemic action as well. And I think just bringing that back to what we can do being an advocate is really a privilege. And because of that, you have to start thinking about whose voices you're prioritizing in your advocacy. So we always toss a lot of words around when we're like, as an activist, we talk about being equitable, just and fair. But at the end of the day, words don't matter, people do. And so I think it's so important to just keep people front and center, talk to them and stay in touch with our roots, like what the rest have said. 
Um, yeah, I would thank you so much for that, Kate. Um, and I'd like to, to hear any of you who, who is interested in speaking to this question. It does strike me that the, that the, that the youth climate um, coalition, and it takes many forms, um, the commitment to a deep di diversity seems to be, seems to be a difference in all forms of diversity, um, including neurodiversity. Do you see this as a, a, a generational shift? Um, or is it just that you're just just not willing to compromise on this at all? That it's and and maybe what is the relationship between that commitment to that kind of deep diversity and the the kind of the scale of change that we need and the and the and the speed of change that we need? How do you how do these interrelate? Um, I can go. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. If we're fighting for inclusive, equitable futures, it doesn't make sense for our processes and spaces to be exclusive. Um, so, for example, at Young Friends of the Earth, like we do hand symbols because we understand that there are some people who find loud sounds too overwhelming, too distracting. And we make sure that we welcome people's different learning needs and physical needs as well in spaces. Because yeah, disability justice is part of climate justice. Like we live in a very ableist world and it just doesn't make sense to ex exclude those people from our spaces. And yeah, it's a trial and error because obviously we can't get things perfect. We internalize like so many of the toxic traits of the society that we currently live in. But I kind of love our generation because we are open to people saying, hey, like that is like that is actually harmful to this demographic. Could you try and change your language, the way you do things? And that's one of the things I appreciate about our movements is that we stand back and say, oh wow, I actually need to check myself, like my attitude and behavior. Like what where did that come from? And how can we address it so that you can feel safe in the space? And yeah, we're all about creating safe and comfortable spaces because it doesn't make sense to move towards a just future where we're not moving as a collective. So that's where it kind of stems from, like why we need deep diversity. And yeah, we get things wrong, but I think checking and admitting that we're wrong is very important because I haven't seen that in the elder generation. I'm sorry if I offend anyone from the elder generation, but that's what I've seen personally. We can take it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, look. I think we've been we've been we've been talking the talk, but not walking the walk enough. Um, and and the examples you gave are really resonant. Um, and it really does, I think, embody a shift. Does anybody else want to want to talk about this? Um, oh, yeah. go ahead. Oh no, you could go. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I, I just want to bring this back to values again, because I think it's easy for people to hold on to power. And that's just something that comes along in a very capitalist, scarcity-minded society. Um, even in activism, the climate movement has a tendency to center the same people and organizations again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we're so concerned about diversity, because if you know you're in a position of higher influence or you're holding disproportionate power, then it's so important to actively make steps to distribute some of that power and really amplify the voices of those who have so much experience and knowledge but don't have access to the same platforms to share about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, right, like, I think that as broad as it is a thing to say, right, that we need a shift in the way that we interact with one another and the way that we are in relationship with one another. Like, it's another thing to examine how we are to our to ourselves, you know? Um, and because because the effects of, of colonization, right, both on the colonized and to the colonizer, like, are both negative. Um, 
and whether or not those are subliminally right recognized or felt um or whether that is a conscious thing that you deal with or you know are walking with on a day-to-day -day basis um which is the case for a lot of us i think um but to learn how to be so soft with ourselves that we can recognize uh, our enemies, right, as our relatives still. Um, and, and to open up that space um, and to explore it, because I think we give ourselves a really hard time, right, but this is something that has never been done before, right, in history, like, the world has never been like this and we have never had this much access to one another and beneath all of this turmoil right and contradicting systems and ideologies and beliefs these opposing realms that we're constantly walking in and nag and navigating right beneath that we are also achieving the impo the impossible yeah. like it's such it, it's such a, a huge thing, you know, to recognize that some of us, right, are, are, are here because of miracles, like survivors of genocide, right? The children of the oppressed are sacred in a different way. I think Du Bois said that somewhere, but it's always really stuck with me because we really are magic. And we also carry that power and, and, sort of the blueprints within our, our own genetics of what the future is going to look like. And to remember that we have access to that 100% of the time um, is something that's, that's very powerful. You know, just as much as we're feeling the gravity and the intensity of the state of our world, right? It's, it's both beautiful it, it's beautiful. It's we cannot, you know, recognize it as something as simple as negative or positive, right? Because it's too much of both. Um, oh yeah. God, that's so uh, so beautifully said, Takata. And I, you know, one of the things that I have observed in in um, you know being being fortunate enough to be allowed into some of these youth spaces occasionally is I really notice a shift where I feel like your generation of young organizers is much better at making space for the reality that these issues trigger huge emotions in us, right? And, and you know, I think that the previous generation of climate organizers have been like, hey, the world's on fire, click this petition, go be an activist. And like there, they, there was no space to just to feel, like take in the terror of, of what is being communicated and understand that actually there needs to be care and sorrow and mourning and grief and 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 time just to connect with, with the natural world. And just like, I, 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 I don't know, it, I see a lot of, uh, of making space for people to feel what it means to do this work. Um, and I really hope that that, um, that allows you to be in this work for, 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 for a while, right? Because I think it's, the alternative is a recipe for burnout, right? And that doesn't mean you need to be in it all the time either, right? Every single second. Um, but how did, you do, how did you learn to do that? <laughs> I see you nodding, so maybe I'm right. <laughs> Um, we haven't um, heard from you in a little while, Shia. Do you want to? Do you want to speak to it or any, anybody? Um, well, I'll speak to it a little because I think I've definitely, and I think all of us here have dealt with, um, you know, one type or another type of burnout. And Kate and I can both say, like at Re Earth Initiative, you know, we make it our goal to be radically inclusive, uh, to include, like, you know, as many languages as we can as many points of view as we can have, like con constantly hold each other accountable. But even then in that system of a non-hierarchical system, kind of mimicking the way we want to see the world work, we still burned out. We still, there was time where the organization was not holding together and we all kind of like looked away for a month or, or a little. And you know, Kate was one of the people there holding it all together 
for a lot of us, uh, which I really commend Kate for that. Um, and, you know, it, it is hard because if we want the climate movement to succeed, we need to learn how to take care of ourselves because activism must be sustainable for the movement to be sustainable, for the movement to, to succeed. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have realized is that if I don't take care of myself, I cannot take care of the world. And I repeat that to myself often because we fall into this trap of if I'm not doing three things a day and, you know, like homework and panels and keeping up social media and all of these things, then I'm not doing enough. And that's not true because taking care of yourself and taking care of your community and making space for that community to share our feelings, to share how, how we're coping with all of these different things coming at us at once, that is activism. And I've heard this a lot, you know, joy is a radical act. And it's not even about our present joy, but the fact that we are doing all of this work to preserve joy for future generations. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the main goal of the climate movement because the climate crisis is violent. And in the future, we don't want our kids to suffer that violence. And so we are doing this work to preserve joy. It's a positive movement at the end of the day. It's not about pessimism, it's about optimism. And we are the optimist ones. We are the ones being realistic. And the politicians who are saying that we are being unrealistic are the ones being naive. And I think that's what we have to understand, that we're doing all of this work because we can be, we believe in our power to change everything around us, which is something that's really hard to do. And it takes a lot of relearning, but we cannot do all of this if we don't take care of our spirit. And so that's, you know, something kind of echoing what Takata said, but also sharing a little bit of our story at Rear is that, you know, we do aim to be really inclusive and kind of spread the workload, but it does fall apart sometimes and it's up to us to put it back together. Thank you, thank you, Shia. Um, I want to just do a quick go around with the with with, with the, the the other three, just to have some final words because we're we're, we're wrapping up. Um, just on this question um, of 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 how you take care of one another, uh, how you're building this beautiful movement, um, and also the role of art and imagination in keeping you going. You want to go, Kate, and then Samia, and then Takata. Yeah, I think just adding on to what she said, sometimes when we think of the climate movement, we feel like there is one right way to be an activist, but really there isn't because there are so many ways you can contribute to the movement. Um, whether your strengths are in art, in music, in writing, poetry, there are so many other beautiful ways of communicating all of this information. And we need like every single person if we want to bring about that kind of change. Um, and something I always tell myself is sustainable change for a sustainable planet. Um, and that's because it really is so important to just kind of kick away that need for productivity all the time and just take time to like recharge and reset yourself once in a while. Yeah. Beautiful. We are not machines and neither is the earth. Um, <laughs> Samia. Yeah. In my circles, I don't punish people for resting. Like I have friends who say, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I can't do this task because, you know, like I'm tired, I'm burnt out. And it's like, why are you saying sorry? Like your body and mind needs rest, like it's natural to you. And it's really sad that we're apologizing because of natural feelings. And this is something that I always try to like spread a message on to people. Like you are a human being. Like you are not supposed to function 24 seven. You deserve joy. You deserve to have hobbies as well. Like I always remind people who always message me about climate activism. I'm like, guys, this is great, but I also love to skate. I like to listen to music. I love watching like funny comedy movies. Like there is more to me than my activism. And this is what I try to spread in the movement. Like we are fluid, holistic beings that have come together because of this shared common vision and that's what's so beautiful about us we're so different but we have this shared vision and we fill in the gaps like I have my strengths and weaknesses my weaknesses could be someone else's strengths and that's how we complement each other that's how I see a movement and we there is space for everyone kind of like what Kate just said like 
you could be an artist, you could be a musician. I even like say people who are therapists, who are chefs, like they are important for our movements. They nourish us, they heal us. And yeah, like this is what I want people to remember. Like there's no one way to do activism. Like it comes in different shapes and forms and like, please rest, like your mental health matters so much. Like don't feel like you have to be a robot doing over a hundred tasks, like it's fine. And yeah, I'm gonna stop there because of time. <laughs> That's beautiful, thank you. Takada, some final thoughts from you. Yes, um, as far as art, um, it's definitely proved to be uh, an essential part of my life and well-being. Um, I actually just got done recording for the first time NEP with one of my really good friends. And that was a very cathartic, very cool experience, you know, to have something be, I guess, a dream at one point and now to have something real, right, that I can listen to. Um, yeah, it also involves, has involved, you know, a lot of talking to myself and like really actually like vocalizing that I'm there for myself, um, you know, which is a little embarrassing to admit, but I'm not afraid, you know, I'm not a boring person. I'm a fun person. <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoy myself. Um, yeah, I started writing. Um, and I just think that it's a, it's a really radical thing, you know, like joy is a radical thing. I think that softness is really revolutionary. Um, and being surrounded, right, by, by systems and institutions which urge you always to sort of harden um, to to the feelings and, and also to each other, right? To, to be vulnerable is something that is so necessary to have those lapses of honesty with ourselves and with one another about what it means to exist right now, um, right? Like we're all coming to a place where we're gonna have to start interacting with each other again um and i really hope that we can start to be conscious right about what that's going to look like and what that feels like um yeah and we can make it beautiful for each other <laughs> oh my goodness what a wonderful note to end on yes as we come back into physical space together let's bring some of that softness with us and openness and transformation um i could not love uh, you women more. You are incredible. And uh, I, I just like to repeat um, what I've heard from young organizers uh, the world over, which is if you want to support us, join us. Um, do not offload this crisis onto young people. It's all of our work. We need to build intergenerational movements. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody at the Othering and Belonging Summit for your beautiful work. It's been an honor to be with you today. Thank you all. Yay.